Hey everyone, Maya here from Ninja Pools. This is my interview with Mike Finnegan. He's familiar to most of you. He's the guy that designed the Twins fight in more of Lorcash and took over as lead encounter designer for the entire Elder Scrolls Online almost four years ago. For a guild like Ninja Pools, which loves trials and dungeons, he's pretty much our guy. If you fight it or kill it or it kills you, it's one of my teams that probably did it. <laughs> right. So <laughs> everyone who has blown up uh, their group in Dretzel Reef, like yeah. creating the ice and fire bubble, they have yeah. uh, you to thank. Yeah. Is that uh, <laughs> yes. My team for sure. For sure. Mike also had a crucial role in the development of Endless Archive. And we talked about what a challenge that was, even if players don't always realize it when we we came in and we took we were going through the design angles for this stuff and it was like this is really ambitious guys this is really ambitious this is why we dedicated like an entire dungeon pack block worth of time to doing just this nothing in eso has been built to be systemically endless like this it just hasn't so developing how that's going to operate and what that means was a very tall task from the team the interview was recorded over Discord, so the sound quality isn't perfect, but Mike is such a delight to listen to that I don't think it matters. Anyway, enough teasing, let's get into it. Well, hello, and thank you for this. Yeah, um, no problem. So just a little bit about you. You're the lead encounter designer for the Elder Scrolls yes. Online. Explain yep. to me what a lead encounter <laughs> designer does. <laughs> sure. So I have uh, three teams that are underneath me. I have the dungeon team. Uh, they handle all instance combat uh, arenas, dungeons, trials. Uh, I have the uh, encounter team, and the, uh, that is the largest team that uh, I'm in charge of. And they handle everything in Overland. The, the one thing that a lot of people don't realize about the encounter team is how much other stuff they do other than just placing monsters. Now, they do all delves and public dungeons and world bosses and every monster and critter that you would see out in the world. But they also place all the resource nodes they uh, do all the justice uh, gameplay, uh, so they tackle so much that uh, that's why the team is kind of the biggest and, and uh, focused on that. And then the other team is the monster team. Uh, so any new monster that gets put into the game is is uh, one of the teams. I, it's done by one of the teams I manage. I like to say for the lead encounter designer, uh, if you fight it or kill it or it kills you, it's one of my teams that probably did it. <laughs> Right. So <laughs> everyone who has blown up uh, their group in Dretzel Reef, like yeah. using the ice and fire bubble, they have yeah. uh, you to thank. Yeah. Is that uh, yes. Yeah, so my team for sure. For sure. <laughs> and that's the funny part is, is like if, if something goes wrong there, absolutely blame me. If something did well, then it was the team that did it. Uh, uh, so I like the sound of that. <laughs> so how long have you been doing this? Which DLC was the first uh, with you as lead? I started before uh, as lead of dungeons. Yeah. Um, so I say I started before the game launched. Uh, I started on ESO and I started as a senior encounter designer or senior content designer on the uh, dungeon team and then uh, worked my way up to lead of the dungeon team. How long, how long ago did I do that? Though? Morrowind maybe. Wow. That's, that's Maelstrom, no, Ma no, that was Arsenium. So it's been a while. Uh, that was as lead of that, and then right before the pandemic hit, I took over as uh, lead encounter designer and had the three teams and stuff. So, and th so that was 2019, 2020, somewhere around there that I took over. So I've been doing this for uh, as lead encounter designer for three years. Looking back on all those boss fights. Are there uh -huh. any, you know, Finnegan touches? Any signature Finnegan touches that can be detected? Uh, that you no, so uh, it's one of the. So what, with with what we try to do here, and it depends on um, the the team and and kind of their focus. So for uh, the dungeon teams, they're going to focus on uh, mechanics and tight gameplay and stuff like that. Whereas the encounter team, we know the overland is a bit easier than um, 
dungeons and trials and stuff uh they focus on theatrics and presentation and stuff like that so it's a very different aspects that you would focus on um as far as the uh dungeon key dungeon team what we try to do is is reinforce the core combat mechanics so things like dodge roll block uh interrupt uh movement being just a core thing that we think uh is fun in our game it's one of the a, a big distinguishing mark from our game and other games anything that kind of highlights that i know some of my earlier boss encounters that people will recognize like the twins from uh marvel or was was uh one of my fights um seeing i don't know that there's any like hallmark or signatures for anything that i've done other than to say we kind of as a team push to have you know reinforce all the core combat mechanics because those are what make you so fun yeah yeah i get that i may be a little biased but i think the encounter design the bosses the mechanics mm-hmm. are one of the highlights of this game a lot of players <laughs> log in every day just to do that yeah and they're they're uh the team that that, that does this they never cease to amaze me and every single time you know we come into something and you know, like here's the the story of the the dungeon or trial or or, or something, and say, okay, this is what we want to do, and then we kind of let them run off to develop how they want their fight to go and stuff. And I mean, there's a lot of times where they'll come and they'll say, "This is what I want to do," and I'm like, "Can you do that? You sure you can do that?" <laughs> like, so, uh, like the lava pool rising in Rock Grove and stuff. It's for the final boss uh, and, and stuff like that. I was like, "Can we do that?" And then they. Like I said, they, they're they're really, really good at what they do. So uh, it's pretty awesome to see some of the stuff they come up with. Yeah, that lava thing, it's so terrifying. I love it. Yeah. Do you have a favorite type of attack or mechanic that you really enjoy throwing at the players and just see how they react? Um, I think it depends. <laughs> like Different roles should be challenged in different ways, and it really is going to come down to a specific fight. Like I don't try to push too much into the designers to say that we should do this specific mechanic mainly because they're the designers were hired to design so like i i it's actually one of the the toughest parts of the lead was to not try and take over everything and say no no no, we should do this no we should do this is is to, to come in and say okay let's see what we're doing and make sure it hits all the moments so like usually when we have our initial playthrough or prototype or something and we'll sit here and play through and then we'll identify things like okay well there's a whole lot of melee in this fight um we should probably you know what are we what are we trying to do are we trying to distract players are we trying to move people out i'd say that one thing i i think that works well for players and that we've liked to do is is an um, organic split from players not quite the hard split that you saw in AA or Hellrot, where it was just, nope, you're definitely going to have to split your group. The more decision moment splits that we have. So like Mob Lorkash at the end, deciding who goes into, you know, the backyard or something like that. Right. Yeah. It is, uh, it, and it's great because it's a decision point for the players to go ahead and, uh, decide who is going to do the same thing with at the end of Sunspire where you, you have to go into and fight the, the avatar and stuff like that. So like uh, those kind of moments, I think are really, really fun for players. They work better in trials than they do in dungeons. Um, I, I like those moments to give people like little jobs to do. Yeah. And a lot of people do love that. Uh, I, we have uh-huh. people in the guilds that are just like, if there is a portal or anything like that, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> You've been doing this for a, for a, for a long time. And I think every year, every dungeon, every trial, it's just getting better and better. So obviously you're good at it and you have a great team. You, you mentioned yeah, that. So for is sure. that kind of what gave you guys the confidence to do something so different this time around with Endless Archive? Yeah. Um, so whenever we do anything new in the game at all, there's a certain amount of risk. I have supreme confidence in everybody on the team. But at, even that said, when we, we came in and we took in and you know kind of we were going through the design angles for this stuff and it was like this is really ambitious guys this is really ambitious this is why we dedicated like an entire dungeon pack block worth of time to doing just this um so the biggest hurdles were always the ones that we didn't know um where we know how to do like i had i had all the confidence in the world that we would be able to retrofit bosses to fit into um their arenas and, and, and do what we wanted to there because that's kind of our wheelhouse. We've done that before and it's, and it should be uh, relatively straightforward. It's all the other stuff. It's the stage structure. It's the verses and visions. It's the, you know what I mean? Like there was so much of this stuff, but I think that, that having such a strong 
team and leaning uh, quite a bit of it on stuff that we've done before was uh, what gave us kind of the confidence to be able to tackle it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, to to an outsider, you know, this seems like quite a daring and innovative. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> Is that how the team saw it? You know, how was that viewed around the office? You're know, like, wow, we're doing something crazy. <laughs> um, it, it's really great because uh, uh, I, I, that's another part of the team too, is the team has built not just the confidence of uh, me and leadership, but the rest of the studio um, kind of, uh, you know, is confident that when we're going to tackle something or announce what this is what we're going to do and stuff like that, we get people excited uh, about that kind of thing. So when we were able to um, kind of pull the wraps off and and have all the meetings and discuss what this thing was and stuff like that, I think that generally we got uh, everybody going, oh, wow, that's really, really cool. Um, and they were really excited about it and stuff. And we engaged everybody with it. You know what I mean? When we went to our uh, systems and gameplay integration team, we said, this is what we're planning on doing. And then, you know, their eyes light up and they're like, oh, cool. Well, this is how we're going to do with this. Um, we actually engage teams that we don't normally engage um, in here. We don't normally work with like the UI team and the UI engineers quite a bit. We don't, uh, we have a, a development tech team that, um, we handle some development requests, but for the most part, we don't work with them quite as much. So being able to like broaden out and saying and incorporating all these teams that we don't normally incorporate um, also helped. But like I said, everybody was like super jazzed. Once we kind of said, this is what we want to do. Everybody was like all on board and really, really excited about it. So it wasn't tough to get people on board. Yeah, I can imagine. As you said, you guys already had a tried and true release schedule, but obviously mm -hmm. you, you dropped it instead of a dungeon and DLC zones. Mm -hmm. We're getting this huge system with gameplay elements that are mm -hmm. completely new and alien to ESO. You know, mm -hmm. the random encounters, the permadeath, the versus visions, like so complex. What was the original developmental goal that kicked off this whole process? Um, I think there was a couple. Uh, one of them was uh, to provide a, a, a new system that we could continuously push and challenge players with and basically allow it to be, for lack of a better word, evergreen. Uh, you could, we can continuously change this and adjust it and make uh, and augment it and stuff like that in the future. And it then becomes content that we can keep doing for uh, that, that players will want to revisit, you know, as we make adjustments and stuff like that. So um, that was part of the big design goal, but it was also to highlight a lot of the stuff that, that maybe some players haven't seen before or seen in this way. Uh, and I think the third design goal um, was uh, duo content. It's long been asked for long been requested from players to you know uh hey like uh, i know maelstrom we got the initial feedback say, hey maelstrom yeah it'd be really cool if i could do this with a friend and stuff like that um and uh being able to kind of build that from the ground up into the experience um was uh, was a boon and it was a big design goal for us so when did the idea of a roguelite endless dungeon first crystallize? Do you, do you remember? Oh, it was last year sometime. I think is when we were uh, when we were writing when I was writing some of the designs for this uh, on what it was. And yeah, you know when uh, we have discussions and they're like, "Well, what about an endless dungeon?" And then it was a matter of, "Okay, what does that look like? What does that mean?" And then it's going down to design roots of like, well, what does that mean in uh, ESO? And what is the best mechanism to deliver that and and stuff like that? So, uh, and and we also recognize early on, this has to be systemically endless. You can't just have, you know, a uh, maelstrom or something like that that has an end to it or just kind of restarts. I think that that would get boring. So we wanted to add randomization to it. And then you start taking a look at uh every mechanism or design uh, that's out there of like, how does this deliver it and how does this feel good and stuff. And that kind of all just blended together to inform that, you know, like when you say, Oh, we're going to do endless content. Okay. Well, how do you keep it fresh and interesting and not boring? Okay. Well, you add randomization to it. And then we started taking a look at, okay, well, randomization, but there, what roguelikes do really, really well is, is uh, randomization and playing through the same content but you gradually get better um and we wanted to reinforce that as well and that was when we started to explore mechanisms for how to do that so how long has it been in production in total um since last year and and it's a it's a put up put down kind of thing so it's a, it's a weird mm. uh situation where 
we'll pick up something and we'll say, you know, oh, this is uh, what we want to do. And then we look on the schedule, we're like, okay, we're going to dedicate all this time to it. And then we have to go back. And so we've had, you know, two releases this year. So we had uh, a balance pass before, uh, uh, which is a big block of time where we sit down with QA every single day and they do balance passes on uh, the two dungeon pack earlier this year and then on the trial as well. So that takes time kind of away from some of these things too. And then we're developing content for future releases. So that pulled away from the team. So it's like this kind of like pick it up, put it down, pick it up, pick it, put it down, pick it up, put it down. So off and on for about uh, for over a year. That's wow. Cool. Yeah. I, I asked yeah. because um, I think life service games often give the impression yeah. that they're being kind of made almost moment to moment. I mean, right, right. You know that they're not, but I think it's no. especially for players to forget just how long these timescales are. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah and it, 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 it's also funny that in that regard that like looking at our schedule and uh, because we have things planned out as an example, we could look and say, well, we're already behind for you know future releases next year or the year after you know what i mean or something like that so we'll have to yeah. take a look at it because of how just everything kind of slots into the schedule and stuff like that so uh that was a uh, it was it was no small amount design wise to figure out to, to solve the problems that we didn't know that were problems yet but then also from a scheduling standpoint of saying okay we, we have to have time in order to kind of do all of these things so let's let's focus on doing that so yeah, I, I think I can imagine that, yeah. Um, <laughs> was there a specific roguelike game you and the team looked to? Like, you know, maybe a game that people were playing and talking about around the office? Um, no, I think we tried to borrow from a lot of games. There's games like uh, Dead Cells and Hades and stuff like that. And I think that taking a look at some of the elements of those games and what they did well and what was really successful, I think Hades... Uh, biggest success and not to say that the other elements weren't successful as well is their story element and their driving factor for that that they had great characters great story elements so we wanted to and that's a hallmark of ESO anyways we wanted to carry that forward but they're also their their systems of um, you know the random buffs that you're provided from the gods as you're going through and stuff like that that's good you can kind of see that influence a little bit in the verse the verse choices as you're going through um and then uh, Dead Cells did a really good job of having persistent unlocks that you could do, and they did it, uh, you know, as you as you per progress through, and then you get these really cool unlocks that are then permanently unlocked for you and stuff like that. So that kind of informed some of the permanent unlocks we have for Archive of Fortunes, but also the visions, the long term run, looking at it that way. So I would say those two were were pretty big influences on on uh, what we were looking at. But then there's other stuff, you know, from like. Dark's Dungeon and, and stuff like that that we were we would take a look at and and how to incorporate and stuff like that and then you have it, it, then it's there's there's games that aren't even like roguelikes that would inspire it the Marauders are a good example of that they they came from any other game that has some random big monster that shows up and then goes away when it's when, if you if you can't kill it or or you get a shot to kill it and get extra loot and stuff like that so it, adding those kind of spicy elements was just how to incorporate all of it uh, into something that was going to be fun for the players. Mm, yeah, I can see that. So it wasn't an edict laid down by Phil Spencer at Microsoft. I mean, we know he's a massive Vampire Survivors fan. Maybe that's why he's buying up studios to make more games like that. <laughs> no, this is not a, this was not, uh, this is not a Microsoft driven thing. Uh. <laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> what do you think it is about this genre that is so enduring? I mean, it just won't go away. You know, it's been around for ages. It's, it, it is weird because when I first played roguelikes, I had this, uh, you know, I was kind of like, oh, I mean, I got to start all the way over. And then um, you start to play to get more, a bit more, and you kind of see that it's not about there is no progression. It's just about how that progression is presented and um how it all kind of fits together and i think that you appreciate that and i think that the roguelikes that you've seen that maybe have a a, a harder curve for progression you'd see those as as being possibly not quite as successful so uh, we want it's a it's a fine line uh so to speak uh so and i think the ones that like i said the ones that do really really well um kind of thread that needle quite a bit and uh, and then also adding you know actual story beats and actual story elements to it is, is such a big help 
I think that helps us out too. Is, you know, you're going to see different story elements as you come through here. Yeah. So, what were the challenges in translating Ooh. those experiences? To ESL? <laughs> well, I mean, the biggest challenge is the biggest challenge is that this wasn't done before. So, from the ground up on a tech and and back end level, um, so nothing in ESO has been built to be systemically endless like this. It just hasn't. So developing how that's going to operate and what that means, and then a way for us to influence it to ensure that we can make adjustments in the future that makes sense was the tall was a very tall task from the team. We actually worked with our dev tech team and stuff to make sure that on the back end we had all the tools that were needed and the server understood what was going on in order to add that persistence. I think that that would be the biggest uh the biggest thing that we had to get down is to come up with that structure and develop this tech from the ground up to say this is going to persist forever and where are the hooks and how is it going to know that and what's it going to look for and all that other stuff. So yeah, that was probably uh, the biggest challenge. But then, you know, a, a lot of the stuff is there's challenges that that people may not even realize, even getting the, the achievements in and how those are going to be tracked and stuff like that. Or uh, while we do know how to do achievements, how to do it in this type of environment is, a, is another way to do it. Um, so and then there's also the individual boss fights and stuff like that, that there was a lot of work that went into just, you know, uh, curating which bosses we were going to use and which abilities we were going to pull and and everything to make sure that th that we had you know kind of these uh, experiences that somebody comes in and says oh I've seen I've seen Lord Warden before but then you fight it you're like oh well, this is different because it's you know it's two people and stuff like that so and then wrapping it all in a fictional wrapper to yeah. explain away well, how all that happens <laughs> so yeah I, I loved seeing the old bosses reappear at the end of yeah. the cycle it, it's like seeing an old friend you know sometimes you yeah, don't like them very much <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah that was that was a brilliant <laughs> idea um, you have said in the past that the space of a boss fight and the boss yeah. itself like should inhabit one another you know, yes like frog charging out of that cave or right, right. you know in his little lake of oil yeah so what reservations did you have about you know lifting these enemies out of their original space and basically transplanting them into a new, sure. more neutral space? Yeah, so um, that was the uh, work of uh, the designer who was kind of curating those bosses. And that was a, a, a big ordeal to say, we want the essence of these fights, but not necessarily some of the structure for some of them because of that exact thing is, is we can't have, in other words, we can't have one shots that are going to one shot people if you're not a tank or something like that, because, you know, <clears throat> uh, well, at least not to get to further arcs, but uh, because we want to, to make sure that this fits for two players, we can't have, you know, this thing of, oh, well, four players have to activate this because that's how it was in the trial. And we can't do that because there's only two people in here or one person in here. So um, that was the biggest challenge, I think, uh, is taking a look at the boss and taking a look at what they do and then retrofitting it for two players and then going through, like I said, 60 plus bosses, uh, the balance work alone was enormous uh, in here because you're not just balancing bosses, you're balancing bosses in various arcs as it goes higher. And so it was, it, <laughs> it was quite a bit of work. Um, and uh, yeah, it, as far as going with the, the fight spaces, it was basically to translate some of the areas and the fight spaces into this space in, in, in a way that makes sense. I think this is just as a good example where, uh, when when he spawns, his pads are around the room, you know what I mean? So that you can yeah. cleanse and stuff like that. We want to make sure that we kind of incorporated all that stuff. So people coming in there will recognize what they have to do. Yeah. Yeah, I was too excited looking as a chester that I completely forgot to cleanse. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I think it, it's probably easy to underestimate the work involved in reinventing all of these fights. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I get, you know, the assets and the code already exist, but you can see a lot of tweaks, massive changes that have been made. And I can imagine there are many more under the bonnet. So yeah, that's yeah. to get a bit of insight in there for sure. Yeah. Were there any bosses that you wanted to include but had to abandon? Um. So uh, we, uh, as part of the evaluation process, that was what it was because we had specific bosses, and you don't want what what we want to avoid is uh, players walking in and seeing a boss and go, "It's this." 
boss, but oh no, it's different. So you wouldn't see a Lady Blaine and a Lady Thorn, for instance, because they're essentially the same monster. So and you shouldn't the only the only indicator shouldn't be the nameplate or something like that. So we want to make sure that we include those Malbroga and the other uh void lady. Uh <laughs> yeah. We didn't have Malbroga in here. And it was funny because I saw some people, some people, especially people that are used to Vatishman, and then they saw her pull up, but she was the Markarth. She was a Markarth boss. And they're like, oh, she didn't do all of her mechanics. And I'm like, well, that wasn't Malbroga. <laughs> that wasn't Vatishman. That was the other one. They're like, oh, okay. And stuff like that. So, what kind of the caveat there was like, let's not put two things that look the exact same in here and expect players to just know. Okay, this is different. What one uh, caveat though is like you'll see Rakat in here, and you'll see Lord Warden, and they're essentially both Grievous Twilights, but Rakat has a unique look to it. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we're like, okay, that's fine. We can do that. Um, so I would say that uh, you know, like when we when we wanted to put dragons in here, that was a good example of saying, okay, well, which dragons are we actually going to put in here? because we can't just chuck this thing full of dragons we can't have dragons that look the same as the other dragons so uh yeah and then pulling back and say and, and a big part of why we chose the bosses we did and what went into those was how well we could translate their abilities to two players uh so loki for example pretty tough uh to translate for two players uh so that that was a big factor and we'd originally had, had kind of come into it and said okay we want to do this stuff that's cool and then actually what's funny is, is some of the bosses um actually just got changed into marauders so some of the bosses that we were planning on or we potentially were going to do we said oh and then we were like well let's do the marauders and then we put the marauders in and we're like okay now this is where we can get, kind of get some uh some of those bosses yeah i had so much fun with those i don't know why but like I was they're a scary moment the they're a big scary <laughs> moment that happens because yeah. all of a sudden you're like oh no that thing's here and stuff so yeah <sighs> and uh yeah personally i never get bored of seeing grievous twilight so yeah get them all in there <laughs> <laughs> so how much more work was this compared to a dungeon dlc you know it's a complete i'd say that the biggest yeah. amount of extra work was primarily tech and back-end work but it's also it's different work. So like, like I said, the team is used to, I have, I have several encountered designers on the, on the dungeon team there and they're used to doing bosses and some back end work and stuff like that. So taking these designers and then throwing them these new curveballs, that was the biggest challenge, especially as like, as we went into this and said, okay, let's identify the tech requirements that we're going to need because tech needs a lead time in order to get it in before we can use it. Uh, same with UI. So, navigating kind of those waters i think would be the biggest challenge of the stuff we didn't know uh and then as stuff crops up this works this doesn't work we need to change it that kind of stuff and adapting to that stuff so a lot with uh dungeons and trials and stuff like that it's, it's, we know how to do that we've done that for a while we challenge ourselves by doing new mechanics and new uh, and interesting things but it was the stuff we didn't know that uh that really pushed the envelope yeah i can imagine that yeah I think I spent maybe 30 hours in Endless Archive on PTS. <laughs> All right. And right away, I was honestly surprised at how natural it felt. You know, you mentioned yeah. that before, that if players look past the system and focus on loot and achievements and gameplay, you know, that's a mark of success. Like a movie soundtrack, the, the really good ones kind of go unnoticed. And, you know, that's yeah. the kicker, right? The better a job you do, the less right, right. noticeable by yeah, yeah, yeah. your audience. <laughs> and if people can come in and it feels natural and stuff like that, then that's kind of the goal, right? Is for us to come in and say, okay, as long as you're putting together, you're, you're figuring out how this works and stuff like that. Um, that's good. Now, what's funny is, is, and I don't even know if people realize, there's a whole help help article and help def for Endless Archive um, that people could explore and, and, and game and see and stuff like that. And it'll explain uh, kind of the structure and how everything works, but. Oh, that's cool. I'll definitely make yeah, sure yeah. mention that. Yeah. So yeah. how how proud are you of the work your team did on NSF <laughs> <laughs> So I'm I'm proud. Here's the thing is I'm uh, I'm proud of every single time we do a release. Um I like to say that and this is a, a game development thing, is most of what players see or most of what people see is is this re releases that doesn't look like that for like ninety to ninety five percent of the development. It looks rough. Yeah. It's it's tough to come through and 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 evaluate fights and stuff like that. Uh, it takes a kind of a keen eye to be able to to do that. And the team has gotten really really good at doing that kind of stuff. So 
uh, I'm always proud, but like right before, you know, we get to that like last 10%, I'm like, Ooh, this is, this is looking rough. This isn't it. And then it all kind of comes together and we're like, Oh no, that's right. That's what, that's what that's supposed to look like. So, uh, being able to come into this with all of these new systems and features and, and, uh, and things and having the team adapt and put this together. I couldn't be prouder. It's, uh, th- they really knocked it out of the park. I'm really happy with how uh, Endless Archive has come out and and what we've been able to bring to the game. I think it's really going to enhance uh, ESO. This is a new thing that people can do. And 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 what we were trying to do is cater to a lot of different play styles. There's people that are going to want to come in here and just you know do the daily, um, maybe pick up a side portal if they in that first arc if they see it, and then once they're done with arc one, they're like, all right, I'm out. Uh, and then there's going to be people that are going to want to push scores and they want to get, you know, as deep as they possibly can in order to get on the leaderboards and stuff. So, and we wanted to cater to kind of both of those audiences. Yeah. Something you mentioned, it, it must be absolutely amazing when the final textures and voiceovers are added. I've heard oh, Dev it's say so that great. That's like their favorite moment. In it is. It is. Yeah. It is. It's great. To, it, it, it's one of the great things of the, yeah, like, because we hear, so we have a, a robo VO systems in development. So we'll uh, put stuff in and we'll put lines in and NPCs will speak them. And then every night it'll like, it'll, it'll generate this robotic VO. So they sound goofy through most of the development. But then when we get the actual VO in and plugged in and stuff like that, it really changes the experience and stuff. I remember uh, one of my favorite was Stone Garden when we finally got our cases Oh, yeah. uh, so, oh man! When when we heard that, and I was like, "This, this was this guy was over the top," and it was so good. It was so so good. So, uh, yeah. Whenever we hear the VO come in, it's it's fantastic. Although yeah. I still think yeah. M- Mola Kenna sounds like uh, ACDC a bit, but <laughs> yeah, the case is voiceover is insane, and <sighs> generally the voiceover in the dungeon. There's the whole. Don't come anywhere near Master Arcasis. It's just so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, it is so good. And yeah, with, with Endless Archive, the our uh, department did their usual incredible job with these random rooms and areas that you can see. Yeah. Into. Uh, on the dungeon team, they have a, a dedicated uh, world builder uh, named Mars. Um, and he he does all the, the dungeons and trials and stuff like that. So, um that was actually an ambitious thing for him too, because um, fundamentally it's a different way to build this content, the the content that we have. So he had to uh, adapt kind of to what we were trying to do and then build it in such a way that, um, you know, it kind of fits uh, with, with how we're doing and then make say use apocryphal stuff, but make it all look different. Uh, So just taking like all of those elements and, and, and he was able to crank out quite a few of these little arenas and pods that we have. So it was really, really awesome to see that too. Did you say Mars was his name? Yeah. Oh, what a great name. Well, big shout out to Mars. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, people have been watching me stream Endless Archive. And yeah. so often people go, when I start looking, I was like, oh my God, I didn't notice all the platforms and all that. It's like, you've yeah. got to look up. You've got to look up. Where you got to look up. Yes. Look it's up. actually the toughest thing in ESO is to get people to look up. This is something you mentioned uh, during the live stream. I-, I bet it felt great to dip into all the work you have done in the last decade, you know, bring all of that in, in this yeah. amazing content. Yeah. And, and it was really awesome to, and I think that one of the, the big things that we were trying to, to do in here as well was not just focus on dungeon and trial bosses. Uh, we wanted to branch out and grab group bosses. We we're going to grab story bosses that people hadn't seen before, or that people got a chance to fight once, but not in this way. Um, so, yeah, being able to explore not just the things that we've done, but the things that have been done throughout the game was was a really great uh, and awesome experience for the kind of the person who's doing a lot of the boss curation. Yeah. And we actually got feedback from all over the studio on that. That wasn't just, uh, you know, us kind of going into nuts and bolts and stuff like that. We went into several of our like Slack channels for our content teams and, and everybody else and says, Hey, everybody give me suggestions on what would be cool bosses. So we built this list off kind of that and then we ventured in to find out how we could retrofit some of these things and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, that w- I would, I would definitely say that was a, that was a total, uh, studio effort really. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's a cool little detail. Thank you. 
So this whole interview is about drawing attention to the interesting work you guys are doing, but mm-hmm. the creativity and challenges inherent in crafting something new like sure. this for the players. And, you know, I think we benefit a great deal from knowing more about that. So yeah, is there anything else you want to highlight about Endless Archive and its development that you want the players to think about when they play it? Um, Actually, the less thinking they do, the better... I think it is. And I don't mean that as a like uh you know uh a, a cheeky response or anything like that. I mean that more of like a you know, if you can go in and grok the system and put it together and just have fun running through it, like that's that's what we want to highlight. And and when you see these cool new things and you find this awesome verse and you find a, those are all like really, really cool elements. We've tried to build this uh in particular, we have some elements with visions, with the avatar unlocks, and once you get the avatars, those those things are super powerful and stuff like that. We think those are going to benefit people that are have delved into it a lot more and kind of seen how this is all put together. But as long as people are kind of diving in and having fun, that's really the the what we uh, what we really strive for. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. I think that's a really important message. I think people sometimes focus you know, on the score pushing and everything. And maybe, mm-hmm. just, you know, when you go in for the first time, just enjoy it. Have a look around. Yeah, absolutely. If you wipe to a silly boss, yeah. who cares? You know, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the filers, uh, the the little uh, watchers that come uh, into the arenas and stuff like that, they all have their own like little personalities. So that's another thing that's a that's a really cool element that I think I'm not sure people will recognize right away. But you can talk to these filers as they come in and they they tell you what you know what you're doing. You know, like one guy is like kill, 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 good job, you know, and stuff like that. So like uh, seeing these kind of little filers that are coming around and stuff that just has a personality kind of to the place too. So yeah, definitely. So we're in week three of PTS now. What surprising things have come out of the first two weeks? You know, something that you didn't. Uh, people got pretty deep. Uh, into the endless archive uh some players pushed uh to arc 18 i think um so i think that you're gonna see when we release the patch notes that there's some changes there uh well i guarantee you there's changes there we we were making uh so it's funny because we have that we have dual feedback um and we're trying to serve uh both of those one of the one one side of feedback which i completely respect because i've been doing a lot of press playthroughs is arc one particularly at cycle three and four uh is pretty difficult uh it's pretty challenging for people especially people that aren't used to playing the game um all that much so you're gonna see us take the edge off that make that a little bit easier arc one but then uh the other feedback we got was well it doesn't get difficult quick enough uh and i completely respect that players that are used to playing at a high level uh they have to get through several arcs so you're going to see that kind of address because we're going to while we're going to make arc one easier which for people that are really experienced that means they'll probably be able to get through arc one pretty quickly uh it's going to start ramping in difficulty much sooner uh and it's going to get difficult much sooner so we're going to try to uh, address both of those pieces of feedback where, oh, cool, I got through arc one and now uh, I'm in arc two and arc three in particular, and, and it's gotten chunky difficulty. So <laughs> get people to the, to the meat faster and also cut down on the people that are like, well, I needed to be in here for 13 hours in order to get to arc 18 or something. And it's like, yeah, it's probably, it's probably a bit long. Uh, that can't be easy. I, you know, just looking at whether it's social media or just seeing feedback, it can't mm-hmm. be easy because you're not going to make everyone happy. But you know, it's also right. you guys are really, yeah. really trying. Yeah, that's really amazing. Absolutely, and it's it's it, that's one of the the things that we knew coming into this that we had uh, reached like an internal balance consensus and stuff. And then, uh, but we knew automatically that the minute it was going to get in players' hands, we were going to have to make adjustments because that's naturally what happens. And so we, we kind of expected it and banked on it and stuff like that. So it's nothing too uh, critical, but uh, being able to get that feedback and then trying to develop ways to tackle that feedback, that's a whole nother puzzle element to, to game design as well as <laughs> just reacting to feedback and how best to address it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of general questions if you're willing. Sure. Yeah. So we know that you have multiple layers of testing, you know, internal, mm-hmm. UA, obviously PTS, but do players ever beat content or skip mechanics in a way which genuinely surprises you? 
Yeah, that's happened before. So we'll generally address it. So it's pretty funny because there's there's some things that we will address and some things we won't address. Um, so generally when people beat content in a new and interesting way, as long as it is not become a way that now everybody has to have this particular thing. Like there was a, at one point, I forgot what encounter it was, but people were using Siege Shield to uh, extend the range of their ranged abilities. Um, and this was earlier on in the game. And part of the mechanic of this fight was we wanted you to be close enough that you would not be able to do that. So, uh, but we have to take a, a delicate hand with, with this. Generally, whenever we develop anything, we want people to be able to use their abilities. There are certain things that we don't. Stuns, obviously. Uh, stunning a boss fight uh, or a boss repeatedly is no bueno. So uh, we try, but we try not to clamp down too hard when somebody's going to do something. So this is why, uh, and, and this is part of the internal testing and stuff like that we do. Whenever I see an unbreakable stun uh, from anybody on the team, and I'm like, okay, well, why is this unbreakable? It doesn't need to be unbreakable because that's a core combat mechanic and we're taking that away from players and it can't just be arbitrary because I don't want you to. Well, you're going to have to give me a fictional conceit or some way to explain why we're doing that other than just, I don't want to. Uh, so <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> um, that's one element. Make sure that we address the things and if we have to make adjustments based on how players are doing something, we make the right adjustment that it doesn't feel just arbitrary. What do you love most about your job? Um, I used to joke and say telling people that I'm a video game designer uh, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it actually is a pretty nice perk of the job to say that. But uh, and it's it's funny how many people are surprised by that. Oh, really? And I'm like, yeah, that's a job. Yeah, yeah. It's a job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Must be nice to sit around and play games all day. I'm like, that would be nice. I would really love to do that. But uh, it's it's funny because it's it's at various times of the year, there are different parts that bubble up to the top that are great. So whenever we start a new design and we get to evaluate what the team is kind of coming up with and cooking in the books for you know new boss fights and stuff like that, that's a really cool element to be able to sit down and like read documents or play through something going oh this is a really cool thing yes i can't this is going to be awesome and then uh seeing players test it uh or seeing qa test it as they come in and and and, and kind of working through it to get the nuts and bolts right uh whenever we get the vfx and animations in and seeing all of that put together because that's a whole big presentation kind of thing where you're like oh that looks really cool and that sells really really well and i like the way that's been done and then of course getting it actually into players hands and seeing kind of their reaction to it uh is really big too and also uh, honestly w one of my favorite things to do and i know this isn't normal for a game developer, i love to go out and meet people and talk to people that uh, play the game so whenever we do shows you know like the tavern the vegas event uh gene and i went to QuakeCon. like being able to go and and meet uh the people that actually play the game and just talk with them and and you know it, it's that's so much fun for me oh i can imagine that yeah <laughs> what do you like the least about the <laughs> <laughs> uh Cutting things, I think it was the is the the toughest thing that we have to do. So years and years and years ago, when I uh, first took over uh, the dungeon team, so uh, uh, to take a step back there, we have budgets that we have to hit, and we know how long we know how much time it takes to do a dungeon. We know how much uh, visual effects and animation time we have dedicated, audio time we have. No, we know all of that stuff. We know how long it takes and how much time we have. So invariably, what happens is the designers will sit down to, to design uh, their encounters and their bosses, and then they'll put together a list of, oh, here's all the new things, or here's the things we need new VFX for and stuff. And then we sit down in a room with the visual effects artists and the animators and the audio designers and say, okay, this is what we want to do. And then they give us estimates. A lot of times we're showing kind of like prototypes of it and stuff, but a lot of times they say, well, this is how long it's going to take us to do it. And then once you build that list, then you realize you're over budget because that's always what happens. Uh, so uh, you then. <laughs> Uh, make cuts now back when i first took over the dungeon team i would go through and i would kind of like take a look and based on the, the schedule and how much time we have and i would make cuts to to the work to say okay well we can cut this thing out we don't need this we don't need this okay here you go 
Um, and then I got feedback pretty early on from the designers that were like, hey, it'd be really cool if I can make my own cuts. Um, so it's not just kind of an arbitrary because, you know, you may keep something that I want it. And so I'm like, okay, that's fine. But that's tough sometimes. And that's, uh, I think the toughest part of game design is is realizing that it, not all of this cool stuff. What you have designed is absolutely cool and it just won't fit in budget. So we're going to have to make changes and edits. So yeah. that's the toughest part. Yeah, I can imagine like editing a movie. I used to do a lot of that. Yeah. It's just yeah. like, ha- yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, exactly. But- it's killing your children is what it is. <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah. But um, if I have to ask, what's your favorite encounter in ESO? Everybody asks that question. I, <laughs> I don't know that there is. Like I said, like I usually say, and, and I know this is going to sound like uh, a broken record here, but there's different encounters I like for different reasons for instance uh like i really love um uh, the architect mad architect in in vault of madness because of the presentation of that the windows that crash out and then they they get pulled back in and stuff like that the presentation of that fight beautiful. uh is really really great the warrior is another one that's really really fantastic i mean builds a shy sword and it blows the walls out and stuff it's just really really great stuff um uh challenging wise there's a lot of different encounters that i think our child like i really like uh the twins in dreadsail reef uh the the fire and ice uh guy the first boss it's a really really fun encounter um uh b- b- a bit punishing but uh pretty oh, yeah. fun encounter <laughs> uh um the Rakat fight uh i think back when people had to go in the backyard it was really really good i think people are skipping now so it's not quite as impactful but uh and then uh, a lot of the newer dungeon stuff. I actually really like uh, as a as a piece of content. Uh, I I love Vatishrin. Yeah, yeah. I really really love Vatishrin as a piece of content. I think that it's uh, fun and kind of the interesting things we did there with the unlocks and stuff like that. I was really really happy with. Um, yeah, there's a ton so, to choose from, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really tough to choose just one. Uh, but yeah, and, and like I said, they're they're going to be for different things. If there's because there's encounters that you like for the challenge, and then there's encounters that I like for the visual presentation that that gra- that visually just really pull you in stuff. So yeah. yeah. I'm I'm completely with you, yeah. <laughs> so finally, it's um, yeah. it's been a hell of a summer for RPGs, and mm-hmm. you know, not exactly easy for a ten year old MMO to stay in the spotlight <laughs> with all these enormous releases in the same space. Sure, but I think you guys have had a fantastic year. Scribes of yeah. Fate, Arcanist, Apocrypha, and yeah. Chrome, and now Endless Archive. It's it's been amazing, and it begs the question. How are you going to top that next year for ESO's 10? That is the question, right? That is the question. And we will tell you more about that later. (laughs) Obviously, I didn't expect you to spill anything. I know you did. I know you um, didn't. (laughs) Let me ask you this. How much fun Uh, are you having working on next year's content? I mean, it's a lot of fun. Um, It's uh, it's always... uh, The fun always comes from taking a look at what we could do and then uh, seeing what kind of the team comes up with and cooks up and stuff like that. Uh, Like I'm really excited about, um, uh, yeah, I I, I mean, I can't, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) There's a lot of, yes, we're really excited about what we got working on. And I'm pretty happy with, with, with the stuff that we got coming up. That's really exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing more. But thank you so, so much sure for talking thing. to me. You guys really sure do thing. great work in this game. And Endless Archive is an exciting new direction. And I really hope awesome. that everyone dies right in and has a blast with it. Me too. And that was my conversation with Mike. I am so grateful for how generous he was in his responses. So big thanks to Mike. And to Gina Bruno, who set this whole thing up. And of course... Big thanks to you guys for watching, for supporting Ninja Pulse in all the things we try to do, and for making this the wonderful gaming community it is. Have a great weekend. Maya out.